The time is now 5.30 and a quorum is present. So I will call this meeting of July 12th, 2021 of the Madison Plan Commission to order. First, we will hear from our technical facilitator, Jesse. All right, welcome to our virtual Plan Commission meeting. We're gonna cover a few basic items before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. To members and city staff members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. The chair, clerk, and technical facilitator are responsible for muting and unmuting committee members. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. During any roll call, all panelists will be unmuted briefly. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked questions. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the board, please send it to the email list in today's agenda. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jesse. The first item on our agenda is public comment. I don't find that we have any <clears throat> anyone registered, um, and Heather has concurred. The next item is communications, disclosures, and recusals. Members of the body should make any required disclosures or recusals under the city's ethics code. Do we have any disclosures or recusals? Commissioner Solheim. Um, I recuse myself from items 10 through 12. I'm currently working with a member of the applicant team on a separate development. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else in regard to communications, disclosures, recusals? Alder Heck. Thank you, I have two items, Chair. First of all, I just wanted to clarify uh, on items 10 through 12, if Commissioner Solheim is recusing herself, um, how many votes do we need to pass something? <laughs> uh, let me see, we would have one, two, three, four, five, six people. So I believe that we would need four in order to pass something. Is that correct, Ms. Hazard? Yes? Okay. Chair, Chair, we do have, um, I believe Commissioner Cantrell has now just joined. Um, he'll, he'll be changing his name here shortly. Um, oh, okay. So we actually have two, we'll have eight. And so we would need five in order to pass a, a motion. Uh, even though um, Commissioner Solheim has recused. Oh, I'm sorry, seven voting. So we'd have seven voting, right? We would need four then with seven voting. Apologies. Okay. And on other items, we'll need five. Correct. That's correct. All right. Thank, and thank you for raising that, Alder Hatch. Sure. Also, Chair, is this the appropriate time to mention that I won't be at the July 26th Plan Commission meeting? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next item on our agenda are the minutes of. June 21st, regular meeting. Um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing no raised hands, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Moved by Commissioner Cantrell, is there a second? Seconded by Alder Lemmer. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands to object, the motion passes unanimously. 
upcoming meetings in July and August, July 26th and August 9th and 23rd are all regular meetings starting at 5.30. Okay, next we will move on to the consent agenda. We've had a few things that have been removed from the consent agenda. So currently on the consent agenda, um, item four and then five is on for referral. Agenda item nine, 12, 14 and 15 are all currently on the consent agenda. Um, are there any requests for separation for any of those items? Okay, I see no request for separation, so I'll go ahead and read those then into the record. Uh, agenda item four, Legistar 65932, amending Madison General Ordinances to set the rear yard setback in their traditional employment district for corner lots where abutting property is non-residential. And then agenda item five referred to the September 20th, 2021 plan commission meeting at the request of the applicant and pending a recommendation by the Urban Design Commission. Again, that's agenda item five, Legistar 60917, creating uh, Madison General Ordinances to amend a plan development district at the property located at 115 West Doty Street. The next item is agenda item nine, Legistar 65484, located at 702 Flom Road, 15th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the campus institutional district without a campus master plan for additions to an existing building that exceeds 4,000 square feet in floor area, consideration of a conditional use in the campus institutional district without a campus master plan for the establishment, improvement, or modification of a secondary use occurring outside of an enclosed building and consideration of a conditional use uh, pursuant to section 28.139 of the zoning code for non-residential development adjacent to a public park to allow construction of additions to La Follette High School and re relocation of the visitor bleach bleachers at Lucier uh, Stadium. The next item on the consent agenda, agenda item 14, Legistar 65647, located at 828 East Main Street, Urban Design District 8, 6th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional employment district for a nightclub. Agenda item 15, Legistar 65649, located at 67170 Dana Road, 19th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the Commercial Center District for a wholesale establishment to allow a wholesale beauty supply business in a multi-tenant commercial building. Um, are there any comments on any of those? Seeing none, uh, I would be looking for a motion on the consent agenda. Alder, uh, Commissioner Cantrell. I move approval of the consent agenda and the referral as, referral as uh, recommended. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. Um, I will assume unanimous consent to that motion unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the consent agenda passes unanimously. And now on to the items on our agenda that were not on the consent agenda. 
The first item is agenda item two, Legistar 66213, determining a public purpose and necessity and adopting a transportation project plat numbers 5992-11-00 through 4.05 amendment number one and 5992-11-00 um, 4.06 amendment number one, Pleasant View Road, Mineral Point Road to US Highway 14 for the acquisition per the plat of land interests required. This is in the ninth Alder District. We do have a couple of uh, uh, staff from engineering to help us with questions. The first uh, registrant on that, the only registrant is Robert Proctor of 2 East Mifflin Street, number 200, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, opposed and wishing to speak, representing Apex Equity Holdings, LLC. Robert Proctor, you have three minutes. Uh, I apologize, Chair. I meant you sign up for the Lamp House uh, agenda item. I must have uh, put down the wrong agenda item on my, on my form. Okay, thank you. We will uh, call you then for the next agenda item. In that case, can I have a motion on agenda item two? Commissioner Cantrell. I move approval of that item. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. And I will assume unanimous consent on that motion unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, that motion does pass unanimously. Moving on then to agenda item three, Legistar 65918, amending section 28.071, paren two, paren A of the Madison General Ordinances to amend the downtown height map. And I, um, we will not have a presentation on that unless commissioners uh, would like one. So if you're looking for a presentation, if you could raise your hand. Seeing none, we will go then directly to the registrants. First registrant is Bruce Bosman, uh, Commercial Avenue, opposed, wishing to speak. He's indicating he is not representing anyone. Um, Bruce Bosman, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, apparently my video is not turned on. We do not have video of uh, registrants, so you're, oh. you're fine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, I'm the chairman of Apex, we're local business that's owned by about a hundred individual investors. Uh, we've been in business for about 35 years. We are the owner of the lamp house and the subject properties that will be affected by this ordinance. And I'm, I'm concerned that we, we've been in discussions with the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy to figure out what the long-term uh, future of the house might be and seemed like we were fairly close to coming together on a proposal that we were going to bring to the city to, to see if we could get any, any buy-in. And then this showed up kind of out of left field. It's been what I felt was sort of on the back burner for about seven years. And so I'm concerned that if this is just adopted as written, then all the discussions that I'm having with the Conservancy are sort of pointless and it'll just be back to treading water. So that's where I'm at with this. Um, I guess personally, I feel like the idea of preserving the view out of a private house out to uh, some other location is 
is not typical in Madison. Uh, I've always been told that you don't own your view and you somehow or another this idea has come about where other people are trying to get the view from the property that I own preserved and it seems like this proposal affects practically only apex because we own the house and we own the land and the, the other buildings that are affected by this. And yet we've had basically nobody interested in what we think about whether this is a good idea or not. So that that's my concern. Thank you. Um, the next registrant is Bob Kleba, uh, Gorham Street in support, wishing to speak. Bob Kleba, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Zellers and uh, Plan Commissioners. Um, I strongly encourage you to adopt the alternate uh, building height plan or map. And the reason that I would prefer to see the uh, that it's important to, uh, to, to, to to have the lower building heights in this area is that uh, developers will always be in, uh, try to build to the building height maximum and even get beyond that with allowed excess height. So if we look at the neighboring, uh, the, the neighborhood next door, James Madison Park, we have uh, building heights at six stories and at four stories in a residential, mostly two-story neighborhood. And what we're seeing there is that there's a lot of development pressure on James Madison Park because of the building height, uh, uh, allowed building height. So if we keep this uh, viewing area to three stories, we will uh, be able to preserve what we have as historic resources in our community and uh, uh, not uh, promote uh, demolition and further development with building heights greater than three stories. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Robert Proctor, East Mifflin Street, opposed, wishing to speak, also representing equity, uh, Apex Equity Holdings. Uh, Robert, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, Apex opposes this, but, but we're, what I think Bruce uh, didn't also say is what we would be looking for is a table of this to work on a holistic approach to solving this issue. If you look at the letter prepared by the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, especially the two paragraphs, top two paragraphs or the three top paragraphs on the last page, you would see that what they ask for is to use this opportunity for the Planning Commission and the City of Madison to consider a larger sustainable vision for the future of this important house that provides a holistic development scheme for the parcels in play. And if you look at the next paragraph, it talks about keeping the house in the status quo as a student rental with no available parking and sandwiched in the backyards of larger buildings will lead to its continued deterioration and decline. That's the issue that Bruce, what he talked about, they've been working on and they would like to continue working on to come back. And if the planning commission or Alder Heck, who's the sponsor, wants to participate in those discussions, they certainly can participate, um, participate in them. It's to come back with something that will solve everybody's problems, including making this something that could be enjoyed by the public. To adopt this now would basically potentially be a barrier to that ever happening. It would create, it would in essence establish the status quo of the house remaining where it is with the buildings around it where it is, that's gonna remain probably student housing. So this is a really exciting opportunity um, that this has kind of jumped into the middle of. And the ask would be to table it, to work with both the developer and the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy who are substantially down a path 
that could lead to something very exciting for the city. So that's the ask tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, somehow I lost, there it is. Um, we also have as a registrant, Jack Holtzeder, Katzenbuchel Road, Mesa Maney, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Nan Fay, West Wilson Street, Madison, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. And George Hall, Regent Street, neither support nor opposed, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? And I would point out that uh, Nan Fay did chair the um, committee that made the recommendation uh, on the heights. And uh, Jack Holtzeder did attend virtually all of the meetings, if not all of the meetings of that, um, of that committee. So that just gives you a little bit about why uh, they are interested and available to answer questions. Are there questions, Alder Heck? Thank you. Um, if, if Nan is available, if Nan Faye is available, I, I would like to ask her a, a question. Can Nan be unmuted? Yeah, Nan, you should be seeing a prompt to unmute yourself. Uh, this is on the phone. We have you on the phone. I could un also unmute you. Let's try this. Okay, Man? Oh, heck, I think I should be available now. Okay. Uh, you are. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I know you uh, wrote to us, but I, I, I kind of wanted to hear what you thought about um, what we heard in earlier public comment with regard to a holistic approach uh, for what it sounded like was redevelopment um, that, that uh, of the parcels, that most of the parcels that surround the lamp house. And I think I even heard mention of a potential for moving the lamp house. And how that fits in with uh, uh, the Lamp House Ad Hoc Planning Committee's report that Council adopted in 2014. Um, was there um, discussion of more holistic visions at that time and, and, and seven years ago? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, seven years ago, uh, the conversation was prompted by the development that is the, the new one along North Webster Street and um, questions from the developer there about how basically how large the building could be um, having assembled um, the parcels along that block face. So there was never any discussion of moving the lamp house um, and I am. I have not seen the letter that was um, referenced by Mr. Proctor earlier, so I don't know. I'm not familiar with those conversations. I do believe that George Hall, who is registered and available to answer questions, has a role with the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy, so he might be a good person to ask about the current discussions. But what I would say is that um, the, the remit to the um, Lamp House Committee was to come up with a plan for the block on which the Lamp House currently and has always sat. Um, and so we did our best uh, to come up with guidelines for that. And the recommendation that we made um, is what's before you as the alternative amendment um, 
to the downtown height map. And that was our best judgment at the time um, about how to preserve the view from the house, which was, in fact, the reason for its being where it is. And that's, I think, why this house is unusual um, in the view from the house mattering. And I understand why Mr. Bosman would question that. But um, I should also say that Mr. Bosman um, attended most, if not all, of the seven meetings that were held by the Lamp House um, ad hoc committee, and um, and made his made his uh, concerns known at that time um, as the owner of uh, the properties along the Mifflin Street block face as well as the Lamp House. Thank you, Nan. That 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 answers my question. If if George Hall is available and registered, uh, could we could I ask him a question too? He is uh, registered and available to answer questions. Um. Okay. It looks like he's unmuted. Go ahead with your questions, please, Alder Heck. Thank you, um, George. Uh, we received a letter from the Conservancy uh, that the Commission did, and um, uh, there's in that letter there's uh, what I what I read was support for this particular amendment as well as a wish for uh, future efforts to consider a, a more holistic approach to the remainder of the block that hasn't been redeveloped. Um, it, 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 I don't know if you've read that letter. It was from the executive director. Is is that as far as you know the your interpretation also? Well, <clears throat> my intent is, and I I'm not speaking for the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, but I I believe the intent was for them to be consistent with with previous testimony that they had they had given um, some six seven years ago. Uh, but you're right. Um, we have been in uh, conversation with uh, with Mr. Bosman, and indeed, um, Mr. Bosman uh, gave uh, Isthmus Architects and me access to the house to thoroughly go through it over a period of two days, and. It has, I guess, led to led to some conclusions um, that I think were later expressed in the Building Conservancy's um, letter to you. In that, it would appear that the the time is ripe to really look at a broader gauged vision that wasn't possible, perhaps, in the time available uh, back back in. 2013, 2014, um, and given as as I've been looking at this, uh, the parcelization of the area, the um, for example, the 70 foot depth lots, uh, the the conjunction of the downtown plan, the all the associated codes, the interplay of city guidelines, goals, and objectives affecting the block, and I'm I'm looking at the uh, the one page submission that I made to you. Um, that it's it's complex enough that by itself the ad hoc com committee report isn't really action forcing. It doesn't didn't lay out how a historical district would be uh, designed and how it would function, how it would be funded. And it's the, I guess the the funding of restoration for the lamp house and, and in a sustained way that would preserve it for the future that we're we're really concerned about. And so, how does how might that work uh, given the complex environment that it sits? That's now seven years later, we're seeing the effect of the AC hotel as well as uh, capitals edge on the lamp house so that's i think that's in <laughs> it, it, in a capsule uh if you will the the genesis of the suggestion that this if, if at all possible and and i and my submission i suggest 
uh, perhaps taking um, taking a deep breath and and maybe uh, tabling this, perhaps setting a return date for which this would come back before the plan commission. But give give some time uh, for stakeholders to essentially hash this out and try to come to um, a solution rather than simply letting the status quo remain. And, and I mean, that not adopting this amendment, to, at least to me, and I'm not sure if it is to you, would be um, contradicting earlier stances by the Conservancy about uh, the view from the Lamp House, correct? Well, we know much more about it now, and I, you know, I, I guess um, I would hesitate not to say contradicting, but but I think uh, the view sheds that were in the ad hoc committee report are somewhat um, perhaps optimistic, uh, and that's that's why in my submission um, I included some photos from the the third floor. That's the that's the terrace that originally uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed as an open air pavilion, if you will, with some enclosure. There's a fireplace up there that's now enclosed as a playroom that, that uh, Robbie Lamb constructed for his adopted son in, in uh, I believe, 1913. I know Jack. Jack could correct me. He knows. He knows as much as or more than anyone about about this house. I mean, this is the irony in this 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 circumstance. We're all we're all friends. We're all you know talking about this, and we each of us has information that maybe the other others haven't. So. Did you have any further questions, Alder Heck? Um, I, I just wanted to note, George, your your last point in your letter uh, mentions that if if this amendment is adopted, that you would you are you're asking uh, perhaps for a note to say that some form of plan development process could still play out, and I just wanted to make sure you understood that. This doesn't preclude that at all if it does pass, is it, and that uh, you know it's simply about the heights, and so some other process could play out. I understand that there are a lot of moving parts to what you're what you're discussing, and and perhaps have discussed, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alder Hack. Are there further questions of any of our registrants? Further questions of any of our registrants? If not, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Cantrell. Uh, was staff aware of any of the discussions between the, the owner and, um, um, well, the owner at, uh, owning the lamp house and, and uh, I guess others regarding a more holistic approach on this uh, area, in this area? I can I can start with that one. No, we we're not aware of any recent discussions. I mean, we we speak with Apex from time to time and are aware that they're interested in pursuing perhaps a, a redevelopment in this area at some time. But as far as a, a recent discussion with the Frank Lloyd Wright group, no, we we weren't aware of of that. I guess a, a follow-up question. Um, uh, Mr. Hall recommended some sort of uh, note or footnote um, on on the restrict uh, height restrictions that 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 a potential plan development district or development uh, be a possibility for this for this area. And I guess I, I just wanted to get staff's clarification on 
if this amendment were, if this uh, height limitation uh, was enacted and three stories were limited for the properties along um, Mifflin there, um, if a planned development district were created or process uh, move forward, uh, how would that three-story limitation uh, work? Uh, could could um, uh, potentially some of those areas be higher than three stories or would it be restricted to three stories? Um, but I, get, I guess I'd like to get staff's opinion on that process or, or uh, even idea. Sure. So, um, as the commission may be aware, in, in the downtown height map um, and in the zoning code, there is a provision that those maximum heights may only be exceeded through a planned development rezoning process. And there are some specific uh, standards in the planned development, um, the planned development district portion of the zoning code related to just that. And so um, there have been a couple examples of where that that has been the case. Um, one is the AC Hotel. There was a small sliver of that building that had been shown in the downtown height map for, I'm going to say, six stories. I think it was four or six. And on that small sliver of the building, the proposal was for 10. At the time that that proposal was approved, uh, it was approved as a planned development, and it exceeded the, the downtown height map for that very small portion of the, the property. The same process could ensue for future redevelopment along um, East Mifflin Street in this location. Um, and I don't think that a specific note would be necessary. And I think Alder Heck was alluding to that. That That is the case today. Um, and it would continue to be the case that the way in that, in fact, the only way to exceed the maximum height limits as shown on the downtown height map would be through a planned development rezoning process. And what would the... You said there's specific criteria that would have to be met. Uh, what uh, I can't remember what those criteria are. Um, what? Uh, sure, um, I don't have them in front of me right now. But um, one of them is that uh, the applicant needs to demonstrate that the additional height is not only to achieve greater density than what would otherwise be um, be able to be achieved. Um, there are standards related to um, you know the fact that the the end design is um, it can be demonstrated to be better than than what would otherwise be able to be achieved if the heights were adhered to. It looks like Tim may have it in front of him for some much more eloquent, okay. <laughs> exact language. Okay, thanks. Um, Tim, did you want to? Ah, there we go. I took my hand down too soon. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, I don't know about eloquent, but I did pull the rest of it up uh, in the zoning code, and it is excess height is compatible with the existing or planned uh, character of the surrounding area, included, but including but not limited to the scale, mass, rhythm, and setbacks of buildings and relationships to street frontages and public spaces. Also, the excess height allows for a demonstrated higher quality building than could be achieved without the additional stories. Also, the scale massing and design of new buildings complement and positively contribute to the setting of any landmark buildings within or adjacent to the project and, and create a pleasing visual relationship with them. And finally, for projects proposed in priority view sheds and other views and vistas identified on the views and vistas map in the city of Madison downtown plan, there are no negative impacts on the view shed as demonstrated by view shed studies prepared by the applicant. And Thank you, Tim. One, one last question. Um, would, would staff... Uh, think that it, uh, delaying this project and, and working with the owner and the um, others that um, um, would would have a, a stake in this this issue would that be of a positive benefit for staff 
I feel neutral on that. I, I mean, I'm curious, certainly, as to, you know, what uh, they might bring forward. And we'll work with them in any case when they bring forward a concept. Um, you know, right now, the the downtown height map does allow for greater heights than what were recommended in the 2014 Lamp House report. And, you know, through council action, the downtown height map can change now. It can change later. It can change and be changed back to something different at a later date as well. So I, I don't feel strongly, um, uh, but the plan commission and ultimately council uh, sh should realize that, you know, the staff does not have this on our work plan. We won't be spending, you know, many, many hours like we did back in 2014 with the Lamp House uh, committee to do a, a deeper dive study on this. We would be more reacting to a development concept um, brought to staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions of staff? Seeing none, I would be looking for a motion. Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, I'll move that we approve the amendment to the downtown height map as written. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Cantrell. Uh, and it looks like the Commissioner Cantrell, you had something that you wanted yes. to say or add? Uh, is, it, is it the proposed amendment as on diagram in the, on page two of the, of the staff memo? Is that the one you're recommending? Yes, okay, okay. Uh, yes. Yes, you second it, Ben? Yes, I do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Alder Heck, did you wish to speak to your motion? Please. Um, I, I, um, I, I first of all want to remind everyone that this is simply implementing what has long been in the adopted plan from the ad hoc committee from 2014. Although, as Commissioner Cantrell referred to, we've actually uh, I think lessened the impact a little bit because of the fact that we have uh, new uh, remote sensing data, LIDAR data that refines the height map and, and it actually reduces some of the impacted area. And it also includes um, a, a, a corner of a potential redevelopment of the city owned parking garage across the street on Mifflin. So it, it impacts that also. Um, I do think our discussion was valuable and I appreciate um, what, what testimony brought forth. And I do think that that third uh, standard that, that Tim Parks read uh, has uh, a great deal of potential. And I'm, I'm gonna reread it. Uh, in, in order to get an exception to the downtown height map, if, if this were to go through or even the current map, the scale, massing, and design of new buildings complement and positively contribute to the setting of any landmarked buildings within or adjacent to the project and create a pleasing visual relationship with them. I think that provides a tremendous opportunity. I can imagine approving a taller building on a portion of the apex owned parcels and opening up the view dramatically in some other places of those parcels, if, if done appropriately. I, I have no idea what that might consist of, um, but um, I know that the committee, the ad hoc committee wanted to preserve as much of the original views as possible. So that's a discussion we can have if a proposal were to come forth, but I, I think there's plenty of opportunity there and that this amendment is still worth uh, passing at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Heck. Are there any other comments, discussion? Commissioner Cantrell. I, I agree with Alder Heck. I think this provides an opportunity for the owners uh, to work with um, um, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, Building Conservancy and, and other interested parties and city staff uh, to come up with a holistic approach. And, and I think that having larger buildings along the Mifflin Street frontage, opening up some of the, the view sheds, which 
are really limited now. Uh, I think, uh, I hope, uh, is the result of this. And, but uh, I think uh, limiting the height is important. And, and, but I think that provides the mechanism and, and the impetus for, other, uh, for a, a really good project to be brought forward. And also the preservation of the lamp house and, and conversion to something special other than just student housing. So I, I think that, uh, I, and I hope that uh, this leads to a really good project in this area. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Are there any other comments before we come to a vote? Seeing no raised hands, we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda are items six through eight, since they are related and we will be considering them together. Agenda item six, Legistar 65891, creating section 28.022 through 00506 of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located at 575 Zor Shrine Place, 9th Alder District from suburban employment to traditional residence, residential urban two district. Agenda item seven, Legislature 65483, located at 575 Zor Shrine Place, 9th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a lodge, consideration of a conditional use in the proposed district, for a multifamily dwelling great, with greater than eight dwelling units, consideration of a conditional use in the new zoning district for a residential building complex and consideration of a conditional use for outdoor recreation to allow construction of approximately 480 apartments in two buildings with outdoor recreation following demolition of the Fraternal Lodge. Agenda item, Eight, Legistar 65657, approving a certified survey map of property owned by Zor Shrine LLC, located at 575 Zor Shrine Place, 9th Alder District. First, we will hear um, a presentation by staff, Colin Punt. Colin. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Uh, so this item is a proposal for two five-story apartment buildings with uh, 479 apartment units. Uh, the proposal, as, as uh, Chair Zellers noted, includes several requests, including the zoning map amendment, uh, uh, demolition permit for the existing Zor Shrine Lodge, um, the necessary conditional uses, and the CSM to create the two lots for the residential buildings, uh, a lot for future office development, and, and an out lot for a future street. Uh, staff does note a few items uh, in addition to or including and in, in addition to uh, those in the, the staff report. Um, first, that one additional uh, item of public comment was uh, added late this afternoon. Um, so that is available on Legistar. Uh, regarding the recommended conditions of approval, there is a recommended condition um, from the engineering division that would require uh, text on the CSM stating that the outlot at the north of the site would be reserved for future public street right-of-way dedication at no cost to the city. Uh, the Urban Design Commission, as part of its advisory recommendation, uh, has recommended that one or both of the buildings be rotated or mirrored so the courtyards face inward uh, rather than to the exterior of the site, uh, and then that the proposal would return to UDC uh, after Plan Commission um, prior to final condition verification and sign off. Uh, lastly, uh, I just wanted to um, talk quickly about the conclusion. Um, the comprehensive plans generalized future land use map uh, includes a note in this general location that explicitly states that substantial residential developments uh, within the bounds of what is now the Odana area plan uh, should be preceded by adoption of a detailed plan. Uh, staff believes that the standards for demolition permits, land divisions, and zoning map amendments uh, can be found uh, to be met for this proposal. Uh, however, if the plan commission can 
find that the conditional use standards uh, of approval are met by the project as proposed uh, and with the recommended conditions of approval. Uh, staff would recommend that the plan commission approve um, or recommend approval to the common council for the, the necessary requests. Uh, however, if the plan commission does not believe that the conditional use standards can be met, uh, staff, rec staff recommends that all uh, of the requests uh, either be placed on file without prejudice uh, or referred to uh, a future meeting uh, to enable the applicant to um, address those items and return with a proposal that, uh, that the plan commission does uh, find to meet the standards. Uh, as usual, I, uh, I will be available uh, after the presentation to answer any questions. Okay, I will open the public hearing. Uh, all registrants will have three minutes. The first uh, one is Mark Laverty, Dakota Avenue, St. Louis Park, Minnesota, in support wishing to speak. He indicated he is not representing anybody, uh, but I think he is, and if he could clarify that, I would appreciate it. Um, Mark Laverty, you have three minutes. Thank you. And yes, uh, my name is Mark Laverty. I am with Saturday Properties, the applicant uh, for the presentation itself. Uh, good evening, members of the Planning Commission and City staff. Uh, thank you again so much for taking the time to consider our proposal. Joining me on the call are Natina and David from Cunningham, our project architect, who will be going over the design vision. Also presenting is Michael uh, from Cunningham as well, who is our landscape architect. We have several folks available for questions, uh, including several from Veerbicker, our civil engineering, and also represented from KL Engineering, who completed our traffic study. We also have Jamie and Kim from Saturday. Uh, we are the developer, but also the property manager, and Jamie oversees that property management team, so we can answer questions on that front. So nearly nine acre site is the current home of the Zor Shrine and serves as gathering space and some offices for their organization. We are going to be providing nearly 480 new homes to this portion of the property. The commute and access to the main employment bases in the Madison area will help reduce commute times and the carbon footprint of these residents. The connection to the West Town Mall area with this many people will further help all those businesses. Whenever you talk to retailers, what's one of the first things they talk about, they want more customers. Uh, going over our current site layout, if we can jump to the next slide, please, Colin. Thank you. Uh, we've gone through many iterations uh, in the last year and a half we've been working on the site. Uh, this includes going to DAD on three separate occasions in the last year. The final version is based on the feedback provided by all the members of city staff at those meetings. Uh, also in the staff report, you'll see the comments from our recent UDC meeting. We are able to address those comments. We'll be able to address those comments during tonight's discussion. I bring this up to show that we are open to feedback and we we'll react to that feedback. I also want to mention that we are a property manager. Uh, this allows us to get direct feedback from residents. Whenever residents move into our building or move out, we want to know what they like or didn't like about living in that community. We can then take that and apply it to the next housing community, give those folks what they're looking for. Uh, one aspect that was mentioned is the small area plan, and we've taken into that account. We have reviewed the draft plan and the comments and incorporated those principles into our plan. One of the key components is the creation of a future grid system for this area. The north portion of our site is going to be reserved for a future, right, future city right away at no cost to the city. We hope that this will serve as, example for, serve as an example for other redevelopment proposals in the area and how they can help set up for that future grid. Uh, one of the components of the site is, is we have a large stormland that runs through our site at an angle. Um, but it's something we're going to proceed with with realigning that in order to get our buildings to line to meet the, the layout that best fits that future grid. Another aspect of the Odin area plan is the is public connections. So we've laid out the site to allow for a public connection extending from Zora Shrine Place to the south uh, and ultimately connection to the future bike path. I don't want to always get frustrated about the lack of access points when you're on a bike trail and you end up having to go a mile out of your way when you can see the spot you need to go. Your destination is right there. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony. That concludes your available time. Thank the you. next the next registrant is uh, David Stahl, uh, Main Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in support, wishing to speak. Uh, representing Cunningham, the architecture firm working for Saturday Properties. 
You have three minutes, David. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Punt, would it be a possible to go to page nine? Just because some of the things that I'm speaking of are easier understood in plan form. Um, as Mark had mentioned, uh, we looked at the Odana area plan and we wanted to fit into the future, not just what's there now. So our original plan had a more cul-de-sac oriented project that brought the cul-de-sac further into the site. With the new street future potential street connection along the north, we revisited uh, that aspect to better fit within the, the future city's needs. Another thing that was brought up at our last UDC meeting was the orientation of the buildings. And I wanted to take a moment to explain why uh, we've chosen to do what we've done. So the suggestion was potentially flipping the buildings so the courtyards face in. Now that would make for nice courtyards on the interior, but along the exterior, for instance, along the uh, east side or where the mall is right now, that would put a long wall that just essentially looks over the parking lots. And by bringing the main masses closer together, it allows the uh, courtyards to be on the outside creating individual nice areas. Uh, Mike will explain specifically the activities within them, but uh, those residents that look east get to look over courtyards, other amenity areas like that. We're keeping as many of the large trees along the east as we can, supplementing with new ones. And uh, along the west side, we have our main amenity zone that has a pool deck. Also pulling that uh, back so future uh, development to the west, uh, there's a nice space between there and a buffer. And our two center areas that are closest, we wanted to make sure that that area was also desirable. So that's where we've got uh, an activity plaza or badger alley, as we're calling it at the moment. Some place for game days, uh, food trucks could come. And that plaza really becomes an area that draws people in, may, as an instigator for the two buildings uh, residents to meet. Now, Colin, if we want to go back uh, images, I'll explain what we're uh, what the outside looks like. This is perfect. So we wanted the uh, exterior to be uh, familiar and traditional materials, but used in elegant contemporary manners. Our goal is to be uh, perceived as timeless versus trendy. We have uh, horizontal and vertical siding, but uh, we've made it more uh, current with very large windows, um, wood panels uh, with wood grain to add a little bit of warmth, and um, large balconies for a number of the units. This is Thank a, you. Um, that does conclude your available three minutes. Okay. The next registrant is Natina James, uh, Main Street, Minneapolis, in support wishing to speak. Um, representing uh, Mark Lafferty, Kim Van Dyne, Hoven uh, of Saturday Properties. Um, Natina, you do have three minutes. All right, thank you. Can we go to the next slide? Just take a moment. These are shots looking at the, the corner of the building towards the uh, alley. Uh, we call it nicknamed it Badger Alley. Can we go to the next slide as well? And this is looking back at the main entries. So between the two buildings with the trellised areas are the, the um, public entries to the main part of the building as you enter the site. And the next slide, another great shot of, of one of the side buildings and the greened up and very heavily landscaped around the building. Um, the next slide. One of the fun amenity areas that have, we have paid high attention to um, next slide. The great entry and Badger Alley, Mike will touch on this in high detail as it is designed to be a very active um, program space for the site. The next slide. Wanted to touch on some of the planning metrics for TRU2 zoning. So the building on the left has 216 units and on the east side, 263. Lot coverage by TRU2 is a maximum of 80%. Both parcels are under the coverage 
being at 67 and 68 percent approximately. Green space, most importantly, is a function of units, 140 square feet per unit. Both parcels provide significantly more 50% increase in required green space. Required is 30,000 30, square feet and provided is 53,000 on the um, west and required 37,000 and provided 54,000 on the east. Parking is by parcel. So on the west side, it's one-to-one -one exactly at 216 stalls with a significant number in below grade parking. On the east side, 263 units, but three over 266 stalls. Bike car parking is covered um, as required with the amount per unit provided within the enclosed parking area. I wanted to touch on the stalls provided on the north parcel. These stalls create a one stall per bedroom for the project, which meets current market expectations and important for this project. As reliance on vehicle drops expected, it's expected that the parking can be reduced upon implementation of the east-west street connection. Other items to note, we meet the EV parking requirement for EV ready and installed. Stormwater strategy is a wetland basin to the north and storage tanks in between the two buildings. And <clears throat> um, if we go to the next slide, on the left side is a clip of the Odana area plan. We have been looking at it specifically and see a future park about two blocks northeast of the site. On the right is, is a taken from the exist, existing transit routes, and we have a route about two blocks to the north of the site as well. That concludes yeah. your available time. Thank you. Right. The Thank next you. registrant is Michael Jones, Main Street, Minneapolis, in support wishing to speak. Um, representing Cunningham. Uh, you have three minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so as an overall planting schedule or planting plan, we looked at you know, Wisconsin landscapes and how, we, how can we integrate this new campus with Wisconsin and Madison for that part. So we started looking at like what we're calling the forest edge. And those components of the forest edge uh, consist of oak savannas, uh, wooded wetlands, in an urban forest. Uh, the first of this is the oak savanna, which is kind of more the perimeter of the, the campus. So thinking of how to soften that edge, um, looking at ways to integrate that with the, the future bike trail, um, and then also those edges that those, camp those courtyards would be facing to. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next zone is actually um, called the urban forest. Um, this is also consists of that, that main plaza and also that core centered on the middle. Um, creating an urban forest with use of many different types of trees, um, thinking about, you know, shaded opportunities and how do you integrate the forest as you'd come in as an entry point and a feature, those great colors and pops of the forest and bringing that in multiple different ways, whether it's integrated with planting beds, um, with the trees and just the color itself and softening those edges of the parking as well. Um, and the last zone is what we're calling the wooded wetland. This is actually the lowest part of the site. So really taking advantage of that topography and then using it as an opportunity to use it as more of a stormwater devices at grade um, opportunity. Again, using different type of vegetation um, like swamp white oaks that actually like to get their feet wet. And then also pops of color that can be integrated with that, um, that special zone. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but then I want to start talking about the spaces that we get to create um, with this massing as Dave talked about. Um, your first entry experience is more of like a plaza-esque opportunity to create um, a welcoming to the, this new campus, more of a zero curb opportunity, similar to like a Wound Earth opportunity. Um, great for Madison game days, um, events, uh, potentially food trucks, grills. It's a great way to meet new residents um, as an opportunity um, for those that would even want to visit. So I'm um, trying to keep more cars out of the center um, with this opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we do have opportunities of many different decks. Um, so this is the Mendoza deck we're calling um, the Mendota pool, pool deck. Um, this is the biggest deck of them all, which is on the east side. Um, we're also trying to integrate opportunities to soften the edge with the parking and creating a terraced um, seating opportunity with ad additional plantings with that. Um, this deck also has multiple different little spaces. Um, so whether it's a big uh, event, smaller occasions, or whatnot, creates a, a many different opportunities with the pool, um, terrace seating, and then also small fire pit stations, grill stations to really activate that courtyard. Uh, the next page, please. 
Uh, the second deck, this is actually on the east side, oops, uh, east side on the upper the upper east courtyard. Uh, we're calling this the Mon Monona Club. Um, it's another opportunity to gather with those residents, um, small little niches, and then also flexible opportunities for uh, different games, uh, grilling stations, and seating. Um, also using thank the you, opportunity. Thank you. That uh, concludes your available time. The next registrant is James Gesbeck, Harvard Moon Lane, Verona, Wisconsin, opposed and wishing to speak. You have three minutes. Uh, Chair, there's no person by that name in attendance. Okay, thank you. Uh, all the rest of the registrants uh, are not wishing to speak, um, but uh, several are available to answer, answer questions. Kim Van Dynehoven, uh, Dakota Avenue, St. Louis Park, Minnesota, support not wishing to speak, available to answer questions. Jamie Perona, Perone, uh, again, Dakota Avenue. Uh, south in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, neither support nor oppose, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing Saturday properties. Kelly Track, 5400 King James Way, Madison, neither support nor opposed, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing Saturday properties. Um, Matt Schreiner, 22 Greenhaven Circle, Madison in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, I, I think the Urban Design Committee recommended that um, that a potential re reduction of the parking uh, and maybe addition of some green space in, in strategic areas be provided. Uh, I guess I wanted the applicant to talk about that uh, as my first question. Uh, let's go to um, Mark Lafferty um, for an answer to that. And if he wants to refer it to somebody else on the applicant team. Sure, I can take that. Uh, if we can, Colin, if you can jump to the slide that shows the parking counts. Um, so yeah, we understand and actually appreciate the comment that we received at UDC. Um, it's our intention that we are going to reduce the parking. Ultimately for us, we need to be at one per bedroom uh, is what whenever we manage properties that are, aren't right in a downtown core, that's what we see as the most track record. Um, one thing we're going to do is, is by looking at that north right of way, we'll be able, you know, including that those number of stalls in our parking count is going to go a long way. Um, Natina, was there anything else you want to cover on parking? Yes, I just wanted to point out that um, by the parcel calculations for each east and west side, we are meeting the code requirements to the T with only a three stall overage on the east side. So it's a one to one and the north parcel is what's meeting the needs requested by the client and the marketplace. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell, do you have any follow-ups or any additional questions? Uh, yeah. Um, a, a large majority of your units are studios uh, and one bedroom. There's only a few or two bedrooms. Uh, none are over that. Um, and. And in cases like this, many of the, 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 the at least smaller units, studios, don't even have a parking. Uh, people don't have a car. They may uh, use uh, the bus service. Uh, so I guess I would, I would hope that, you know, although I know the ordinance says one per one, but I, uh, we, we certainly have projects that uh, are, have less than that. And I guess my other question is, is the right of, proposed right of way um on the north side of the project it, it, are those stalls counted in your parking count or are they uh excluded from them mark lafferty yeah i can take that again thank you um for the question so it is we can if we include it in our count that's where we get to that one per bedroom uh 
notion that I read as, as Natina meant to, from the counts per, per code, we, they can only be included in the parcel to get to that one per unit. And I make it important because there's, there is a difference between one per bed and one per unit. Um, don't, we don't question your, your comment of studio apartments. We manage properties that are either adjacent to light rail uh, in a more dense setting, but whenever we see projects that are a little further out from the core, uh, that we have, again, several projects that are match this almost to a T, and we end up being at about one per bedroom, and they have a lot of studios, too. So, again, my, the, 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 right of, the proposed right-of-way, those parking stalls that are identified are within your parking overall parking counts. Is that correct? Just a yes or a no. Yes. <laughs> okay. Got it. So if those, if that area is dedicated to the, uh, to the city in the future, those stalls will not be available. Um, well, they'll be available to park in the street, but, um, but that number will, uh, of stalls will uh, significantly, significantly be reduced, uh, as mm -hmm. I understand. That's, that is our presumption as well. And again, we, with the future grid system, it's it's hard to see when that is going to occur, but it, you know it's our hope by that time that that cars are very less dependent on, um, yeah. and we wouldn't be we'd be able to still operate and still rent all the apartments without needing that additional parking on the north. Uh, do you have any shared parking um, uh, proposals within your building complex? Uh, like, um, like I, I don't know what the ter the term is, but um, some of some of our other developments within the city have a shared parking uh, opportunity. Yeah, it's something that we look at for all of our buildings. Um, Car to go was one of the main users. It's uh, the most recent one we've seen been most successful is actually like Turo, um, which is a car sharing that's actually per rent. But it's it's something that we we look at because residents also they're like if I can drop a car. Uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be all for it, but those options that are, are readily available um, aren't as, unfortunately, aren't as readily available as we want them to be. Um, so it's something that we always explore in our projects. My last question is, it, uh, the urban design, I know, asks that, the, that you look at uh, orientation of your buildings to be flipped or at least uh, um, changed somewhat. And in your testimony, it appears that that's really not an option that you want to explore. So, um, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, 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 the proposal that you show us tonight is really what you're wanting to bring forward. Is that correct? I, I, to clarify the statement, I think we've, I'm, to be clear, we've, we have absolutely explored it. We've looked at flipping one of the buildings. We looked at flipping both. Um, and ultimately what we, we arrived at this because we want to, we want to provide something that is going to be more inviting to adjacent uses. Um, I think it was, if it was totally self-serving, we wanted to face each other, but ultimately want, you know, if there's future development to the East and then the, the parcel to the West, something that is going to be open facing to that side while still having a, a use that can operate in what we're calling the alley. As I mentioned, you know, there's that public connection to the west of the site. We want folks as they're as they're coming in there and accessing that bike path to be able to to see see the amenity deck that's there and have that have that be open to that side. To be clear, it's something we'll continue. I mean, we we heard the feedback loud and clear. I'm just letting you know why we why we chose to have this orientation. Okay, thank you. Does that conclude your questions? Yes, thank Mr. you. Okay, thank you. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, a few questions um, re re uh, related to just the Commissioner Cantrell's previous question. Um, uh, as I recall, the site to the west, the parcel to the west is a prospective office building or office site. And so I'm wondering if perhaps if a building were to be turned, that that would be one that could be turned because it doesn't really need to look terribly inviting to an office building. Do you, do you have any comment about that? Uh, 
Mark Lafferty. Yep, thank you. Uh, that's that is a a fair comment as well. It's you know you're opening to an office building right now. That's that's what we're currently exploring the use to be. It also could be a third phase of housing as well. So it's again we we it's also I'd say more so yeah opening to an office building. You're right, not as critically important, but it's actually that public connection that we want folks to feel that this is a way through through from that bike path to get up into Zor Shrine Place and then we to the housing that's in the north of us and all those jobs as well. So it's as I mentioned, it's something we can we can flip these around. We've done it before. Um but just wanted to share our thoughts and then get your feedback as well. Okay. Thank you. A couple of other questions then about related matters. Um I mean honestly I find the the middle portion uh where the building facade is is very straight and tall to be not particularly inviting, but in the images you showed of the uh, social space or activity space, it, it really looked more inviting than I anticipated. Um, can, can you tell me if those pavers are permeable pavers or uh, some other sort of paver? And I ask because of, you know, it does appear there's not a lot of uh, green space in this in this uh, development. So I just wondered if those might be permeable. I would one of the members from Beer Bicker want to, I guess if I can answer one question, I'll turn over Beer Bicker as it pertains to the exact answer on the pavers, if they're permeable or not. Um, you're right. Whenever we look at it from this angle too, we are, we kind of struggle with that inviting aspect, but it's one where, uh, the only folks have this angle are from the airplane. And what we look at, Con, if we can jump to jump to that rendering is when you do have the the breakup from the up, breakup from the um, decks themselves, and just also the amount of trees and green space that's in there. Um, I think it was actually a couple slides for it as well. Right here. So again, once you have the trees in there, it helps very much articulate and you know, break up that space from a visual component as opposed to just looking down that. Um, so I know from a 2D, completely understand. That's why we, we ask our design team to put together renderings like this so we can get a better perspective. Um, Thanks. Spencer uh, or Matt, if you're able to confirm if those are permeable or not. So are we talking about Matt Schreiner? Uh, is he yes. the one from Beer Becker? Yeah, okay. Matt Schreiner. Thank you. If we could um, unmute Matt Schreiner, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so the pavers right now, we're not planning on those being uh, pervious, um, but we are planning on several different uh, BMPs to meet and actually exceed, exceed the city's stormwater management ordinance will have a, a, a system of underground infiltration. Okay, thanks. I, I, yeah, I think perhaps my comment is more related to the overall feeling that there's not a lot of green area, uh, and I was hoping that maybe something could be uh, have a little more green appearance, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of just guessing, so I don't know. We'll see where that goes. Um, just a, a question about the, the parking lots, the exterior parking lots and their, and their ramps. I noticed that they're, uh, on both buildings, they're towards the south end of the building. And I wondered if there was a reason for that, perhaps the grade, uh, uh because I'm concerned about, uh, I mean, there's just such a massive amount of surface lot parking, uh, cars are going to have to go a fair way through the lot. And I'm also worried to get to the entrances. And I'm also worried about bicycles. If they're all located in the parking level, they're also going to have to come out those ramps, I assume, and have to go through a substantial amount of parking lot, depending upon which direction they're headed, I guess. Maybe uh, if you could just discuss why the ramps are where they are. Mark Lafferty. I just got unmuted here. Um, so to answer the one question, yes, there is a grade component. So the whole site slopes to uh, the lowest point is in the northeast part of the site. 
Um, one thing that we also, you know, by shifting further southward, we don't want when you first come in, uh, understand from a traffic uh, concern, but we don't want one of the first things you see is a ramp down in there. You answer, asked a question specifically about bikes. So our front lobbies are right at the north end of the building. We also have move-ins at the south. Those go down to the basement. Um, so typically, whenever we have residents, our bike parking folks are going through, um, jumping in the elevator from there, as opposed to taking the ramp down to the parking level. Oh, I see. So they they would also come up the elevator and go through the the building to get out. That's what you're saying? Yeah. So the lobby, the elevators, it's right in our lobby, which is on the north end of both buildings. Um, so they can hop out right through there. Again, our lobbies are going to have a more open co-working feel. Um, so folks will be able to go out that way. And then, as I mentioned, there's one at the south end of the building, uh, one elevator for each building at the very south portion as well. That'll be closest to the bike trail. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, one last question. Um, uh, can you talk about, uh, any, uh, like electrical vehicle charging stations, if you're meeting the city's ordinance, I'm not sure if I saw that reference in the staff report, but perhaps I missed it as, as well as other sustainability features that you, that you're planning on implementing. Yeah. So a uh, good question. I know this is, um, with the green charging there's for us, it's, we see the market demanding more. You know, ultimately, if you don't have enough electric char car charging stations and folks show up with an electric car, you might as well not have a parking spot for them. So for us, we go in um, for this, we're going to have about 5% of the underground parking to start out be electric charging. But the biggest thing that we do is work with utility companies to make sure our transformers are large enough that as demand drives it, we can go and add those, char those charging stations in the future. So it's ultimately getting that future proofing just because we see all manufacturers now saying by 2030, all their cars can be electric. So we, we want to be ready for that. Um, and then for green standards, this building, it's going to be constructed to national green building standard, uh, which is one of the green certifications that's used. Thank you. And, and are, have you considered uh, including infrastructure for solar panels if you're not doing it now for your common spaces or uh, other similar features? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely something that we can explore. We're, we look at on other projects as well. Um, so that's something we can definitely take that into account to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place, you know, having the conduits there. So when the solar array, um, when the solar rays are, are make a little more financial sense for a project like this, then those can be added. Um, th thank you. How about um, any uh, like car sharing or, or bike sharing uh, capabilities? Yeah, so it's one for bike sharing. We typically have a few bikes that are that are able to be rented out. Um, we actually try to brand them with the building. It's kind of a fun piece. Um, and then for car sharing as well, I know one of the commissioners had asked that. We we explored on every one of our projects. It really, what we've had and frankly struggle with the most is an ongoing car sharing user because the best ones are, um, you can do a car sharing here, but it's also one where I can leave the car. Like car to go was one of those good users and they unfortunately have gone out of business. Um, so for instance, I can take the car here and if I'm going to the airport, I can drop it there. Um, so again, you have to have something that is totally self, um, you know, has to be essentially self-sustainable and, and where you keep exploring options for ones that can be used at other sites. Okay, thank you. Um, we might discuss that more later, but I'll, I'll uh let Commissioner Solheim have a chance to ask her questions. Thanks. Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, just a quick question on the, the alley um, that's shown with the slightly different colored pavers. Will that just be closed off uh, at times for a special event, but otherwise there will be vehicle access from the north? Is that correct? The rendering showed a a lot of pedestrians in that area, but I imagine that otherwise, are there cars going through there? Correct. We're, we're thinking that is going to be used a fair amount for um, pickup or drop off space. So it will be open to vehicles. Uh, and again, what we've, where we've had this operate best for us is about signing. So if you have, you know, with the, with the change in material by switching to pavers, um, a car just showing up will be less likely to turn down there um, based on our experience on two projects up here in the Twin Cities. Um, and then by showing that this is a shared use, 
by having put you know, pedestrian bike signing in cars, it further is just that notion that number one, slow it down. And then secondly, it, folks will often pick a different way to get to that back part of the site, if you will. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if this was mentioned in your materials, but in terms of amenities, um, also for, I, I would expect there would be a fair amount of residents with this many units with pets. Do you have included, you know, like a, a dog run and any of those amenities because it is kind of just surrounded by parking and pavement otherwise? Yeah, if we can go back, Colin, to one of the overall plans, we do have a pet relief area at the southeast part of the site uh, that's going to be available for the residents. If you see kind of that that whole area right there, um, it's our use. It's surprising how many people have pets in apartment buildings. So it's something that we are are ready for. And again, the by being a property manager, we can make sure that that dog park is the right size to make sure it it works for for folks that are showing up because that can often be a struggle living in an apartment is where am I taking, where am I going to take my dog? Um, another question about amenity spaces. We focus a lot on the outside. I think the big part is inside the building ourselves. Uh, it's COVID has taught us many folks are working remotely and we look at programming our, our ground floor amenity spaces that look and feel like co-working. Um, so you can have dedicated office spaces that you can reserve um, or spots that you can just drop in for the day and that, you know, available to residents. Um, some folks are like, hey, you might want what we've seen or, or initially folks like, hey, I could get a one plus den or a two bedroom, but ultimately folks like that interactive piece. So when you're working from home, it's really nice to be able to still go down and be with be with others that live in your community. And even we started Saturday, when Saturday first started, we were in co-working spaces. So spent several years in there to see what, what we thought worked well for us. And ultimately we outgrew the space, um, but that was good to have that experience as we looked to program those spaces. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have right now. Are there further questions? Commissioner Cantrell. Uh, the the Badger Alley uh, concept, I, I guess um, you you show a lot of parking along that uh, stretch and 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 you know i can see the area that you show in pink that that will be the drop-off area but there are areas farther south that that obviously cars are going to take badger alley to get down to those stalls and i likely to go all the way around and then come back up um are there are there entrances to the apartments on the badger alley or are those just windows uh, to answer your question those are there are not entrances to the apartments it is it is windows or or if the units have a deck they'll have a balcony there as well so there's no direct access from for those parking stalls to get into the units well the the main entry so for the west building the main entry is at the northeast corner and the main entry for the east building is at the northwest corner so that's why we orientated that that pavement and that drop off spot we think that's going to be um where folks go and, and when we do block it off for special events and we we're trying to be realistic that it's nice to get really big turnouts, but traditionally we we still get a fair amount of folks that show up, but realistically that say hundred people that would be there to gather. Um, so that's why we're looking for that sizing as well. And with our flexibility, that's, you know, as we look at our sign part, we always do a sign parking and it is much more smooth going forward. You know, we can look at potentially pushing that further South, you know, and having, have, having some of those stalls be more flexible um, just so we can create more space for those special events. Okay. The, I think the, the bad, I, I like um, some of the concept of the Badger Alley, uh, but I think the Urban Design Committee needs to look at that more closely because it, um, I think it needs, it, um, it, it needs to be, <laughs> it needs to be massaged somewhat because I think that uh, it, it's kind of disconnected. Um, it, uh, so I don't know if extending the, the badger or the pink area, the brick uh, area all the way south makes any more sense. It, it yeah, because you know it may make it a little bit more special than than it does look now. Uh, just like a you know a bay of parking uh, for the area, the the remaining area. But I think that's something that that urban design needs to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there further questions of any of the registrants? Alder Heck. 
Thank you. Just a quick question related to the previous question. So the currently the parking stalls in Badger Alley could be leased by residents. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. That's it. Okay, I see no raised hands. I do have a few questions. Um, some of them are follow up to what's been asked before. In regard to the car sharing, um, what I am understanding is that while you like the idea, you don't have any provision for it in this current proposal. Is that correct? That is correct. We don't currently have a car using service that we've you know, contracted for this site. Um, do you have any of the uh, parking spots um, reserved for the potential of following through on getting a car share service? Or are all of those planned to be um, leased to tenants? To answer your question, um, Commissioner, I mean, we can, we can add the signs, <clears throat> excuse me, add the signs fairly easy to the plan that show, you know, it's a, it's a wall sign that says so car or parking spot reserved for car sharing. And um, so are there any spots that you do not currently have planned to lease to tenants that could be easily uh, so marked? We current to answer your question, we, we currently have all stalls we are expecting to be, be rented by residents, but if you have a car sharing, it's assumed it's being used. So that's something that we can, you know, has a financial impact by not having the lease for it. Um, but it's, we have this space that we can do that because ultimately then they would not be having a car there. Okay. Um, and in regard to the solar, you said that you would have the capability to go solar at some point, potentially in the future. Did I understand you to say that correctly? Correct. We can do future proofing in terms of adding conduit up there and making sure where the, the rooftop units are laid out that we can work around it. And would you be willing to have that as a condition that you do have that kind of future proofing in this particular development? David, do you want to, I mean, just before I confirm it, you're asking, you're asking for an affirmative yes or no. And I just want to confirm um, with Cunningham, is that something we can respond to right now or do we, Need to follow up with staff. That would be David Stahl. David Stahl, could he be unmuted, please? So what I'd be asking for is if you would be willing to have that commitment actually in the conditions. So typically to future proof or not future proof to uh, have it solar ready. Mm -hmm. It involves, as Mark said, conduit or even just a shaft that goes from the rooftop down to the basement and space for a uh, transformer, that sort of thing. Um, the structure on the roof generally can already hold uh, the solar panels because that's, they aren't overly heavy. It's mostly wind load. So it's mostly impactful from the sense of space below. It'll take a couple of car spaces of uh, reserve for said transformers. So to, so to answer the question, uh, Commissioner, yes, we would be willing to to say we will future proof the building for a solar array. Okay, thank you. Um, and on the electric charging station and vehicle stalls, you're meeting the um, requirements um, of our ordinance. Are you intending to have any more? stalls than the minimum required by the ordinance um, available for electrical vehicle charging? I would, is I have a question for call. I just don't, I apologize. I don't remember the number of stalls required by code off the top of my head, but to, you know, as I said before, the market is ultimately dictating how many electric cars, car charging stalls we need to have. So I can say with confidence, we are going to be meeting the code. And then ultimately, that's where we need to future-proof the transformer size for the building to allow to, for us to add more. I would again, really uh, encourage you to do that because 
I would yeah. say that there are a lot of new buildings that are being built that are not providing uh, sufficient uh, charging for uh, their tenants. And we're going to be running into more and more problems with that. I, um, I think it's a great comment that you can continue to make. To, because for us, it's if you don't have a cart, if you don't have a charging spot, then you effectively don't have a parking stall for them. So I, that's, that's our stance on it. We, we also raise our eyebrows when some owners say, say differently. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions of any of uh, the registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I will close the public hearing. Uh, are there questions of staff? Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Solheim. I just wanted to clarify that the UDC, their review that they already had, that was advisory only due to the building type. Is that correct? Um, Colin? Yes. Uh, so this is a residential building complex. Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning that there are there are resident more than one residential building sharing um, access uh, through the through the lots, uh, and so this is an advisory um, recommendation from uh, the UDC. Um, kind of unlike a being in a district where they have um, approving uh, power. Okay, so if we wanted the development to be further reviewed by UDC regarding condition nine uh, or standard nine. Uh, it could either go back to UDC or be incorporated. Their comments could be incorporated in the approval and have staff review. Is that correct? Yes, I, I believe either of those uh, would work um, unless Heather says otherwise. <laughs> I, don't know. I agree that they could work. I think the commission should weigh the, the magnitude of the changes expected mm -hmm. to fully address that question. Yes, understood. Thank you. Thank you both. Did you have further questions, Commissioner Solheim? No, that, thank you. Okay, thank you. Alder Heck. Thank you. This is for Colin also. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about uh, a smaller project, actually, in terms of number of units and residents uh, on our, I believe, our next agenda item that that uh, the applicant has uh, done a, a TDM plan for for that development. I mean, it's a different environment, but I just wondered if if you could explain why not even a traffic analysis was uh, impact analysis was done. Is it just because there isn't much traffic there and, and nobody's concerned or uh, it, it's just kind of a up to traffic engineering to say whether that's necessary? It's uh, in, in my understanding, it's, it's really up to uh, traffic engineering to determine um, how what level of of review of the the traffic impacts there are going to be um there i know the applicant did uh retain kl engineering um you know which is a a, a local traffic engineering firm um that that traffic that city traffic engineering has has worked with many times um so yeah it's it's a it's a determination um of the traffic engineering reviewers um, and I, I don't believe any are, are at the meeting right now, so I, I can't, um, you know, point to, to what that threshold is. Sure. I didn't see an analysis in the, in the materials, but I could have missed it. Um, it, it to me, it seems more likely probably that traffic engineering just wasn't overly concerned given the, the current environment out there. Thank you.
Commissioner Cantrell. I, I guess I'd like to ask staff about my comment on the Badger Alley and, and the idea of potentially extending the the pave, paver is south um, um, rather than where it's where it's configured right now. Uh, um, does staff think that does staff think that has any merit? Should that be reviewed by urban design or or get? I guess uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, that is a. It's an, it's an interesting question. I think it would uh, depend on exactly how the programming um, goes there, uh, whether, you know, whether those, uh, those, the, the, the parking spaces that would be there are um, either permanently open or open at some times, or if some of those become um, pick up on and drop off areas. Um, a lot of the larger projects that we see, um, you know, have have Uber and Lyft uh, and and food drop off places. Um, so I think it would it would it would kind of matter at to to what scale uh, that change would be. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. And, um, you know, Colin and Heather, I know you're not with Metro Transit and um, traffic engineering, but it seems like there are a couple bus stops nearby. I didn't really measure how close they are. And do you expect that people will be using the bus stops? The, you know, these bus routes are pretty far out of the city center and I know they have limited hours. I think it's the 67. Did you have any thoughts on that? Um, Heather Heather can jump in if, if she needs to, but I think the, the at, at on the periphery here where um, transit access is, is uh, not as frequent, um, I'm sure they will get some use, but um, obviously not as much as, as if they were a little bit further east. Uh, I do believe that um, if the BRT route is implemented um, within this area, um, I think it's this project is within um, a close enough distance that it would probably um, be utilized by a number of of, of uh, residents here, but um, under the current conditions, um, I'm not. I'm you know I'm not able to to forecast exactly how many are are going to be there. Okay, thank you. Did you have any further questions, Commissioner Spencer? No, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Seeing none, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. Well, I'm going to recommend that the Plan Commission finds the standards met and recommend that the Plan Commission approve the demolition permit and conditional uses to demolish a fraternal lodge and construct two five story apartment buildings with 479 units at uh, 575 Zor Shrine Place and forwarded uh, forward the zoning map amendment, uh, changing the zoning of property at that location from a suburban employment to traditional residential and the associated uh, uh, CSM creating the three lots to the common council with a recommendation of approval uh, with the additional condition that uh, the uh, project buildings uh, be uh, future proofed, the buildings for solar ready. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? 
Yes, um, I guess when I uh, first read this report, I, I thought, well, maybe it's not ready for prime time. But I guess in listening to the the testimony, and um, um, and I, I think that uh, there's aspects of the project I think are are um, are um, have merit. Obviously, uh, residential in this area I think is appropriate. Uh, having the uh, through street dedicated to the city and for future development uh, is consistent with at least the proposed plan. Uh, obviously, the city needs housing, and I think that um, all types of housing are necessary. Uh, these have a lot of small units. Uh, I think I would, was hoping that we would see uh, um, more larger units, but but that's not the case here. Uh, but we need units of any type and uh, all types. Uh, and so I'm supporting this project and, and um, I understand the applicant's concern about uh, flipping the buildings uh, and, and parking and reducing the parking. But uh, I think that um, hopefully urban design and staff can, can work with them and, and uh, uh, come up with some concepts that might be appropriate for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by commissioners? Alder Lemmer. Thank you. I've got two quick things. Um, first with um, this going to Urban Design Commission so that they can see the updated plan and sign off. I'm wondering if um, Ms. Stouter would be able, when she gives us the updates from you know, different meetings, if um, this body could get a heads up for when this goes to Urban Design Commission so that um, folks have a reminder if they want to attend. I think that would be really helpful to make sure that um, the, some of the items that were discussed here are addressed. Um, and then I also just want to say, I think this is a, a really good location for density based on um, there is the transit there and there is the belt line and there is a grocery store within walking distance. So there are a lot of amenities in this area, even though it's on the periphery. So, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Lemmer. I'm sure that uh, Heather will make a note of that and report back to us when that comes up. Thank you for raising that. Thank you. Anything else before we come to a vote? Um, Heather. Thank you, Chair Zellers. I, I believe I heard this loud and clear, but want to just clarify uh, that the motion uh, would include to maintain the existing orientation of the buildings. And so we're, uh, the plan commission would be returning it to Urban Design Commission for, for final review, but also saying that the current orientation of the buildings is fine as is. Is that correct? That's what I understood. Commissioner Cantrell? Yes, yes. That, that's how I understood. That's what my, what my recommendation is. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Then we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands to object, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on then, um, the next items on our agenda are agenda items 10 through 12. They're related and will be considered together. Agenda item 10, Legistar 65925, amending the East Washington Avenue Capital Gateway Corridor Plan to revise the land use recommendation for the block bounded by East Washington, South Livingston, East Main, and South Patterson from employment to employment residential. Agenda item 11, Legislature 65485, located at 849 East Washington Avenue and 14 South Patterson, Urban Design District 8, 6 Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to allow the partial demolition of a commercial building, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional employment district for dwelling units in a mixed use building, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional employment district for a building exceeding five stories and 68 
feet in height in consideration of a conditional use for a parking reduction of more than 20 automobile spaces and 25% or more of the required parking to allow the construction of a 14-story mixed-use building containing approximately 10,000 square feet of commercial space and 225 apartments. Uh, agenda item 12, let's star 65656, approving a certified survey map of property owned by Baker's Place, LLC, located at 849 East Washington Avenue, 6th Alder District. And we do have a presentation by Tim Parks. Thank you, Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, just briefly, three items before you tonight, amending the East Washington Avenue Capital Gateway Corridor plan to allow the inclusion of residential uses in the 800 block, um, a number of uh, conditional uses, as well as the demolition permit uh, of the Gardner Bakery building, uh, and a certified survey map to combine two parcels into one lot for the proposed mixed use development. Uh, the applicant is seeking approval to demolish most of the 43,575 square foot former Gardner Bakery building located at the southwesterly corner of East Washington Avenue and South Patterson Street to allow construction of an up to 14 story mixed use building that will contain approximately 10,000 square feet of commercial space and 214 apartments for the uh, plans that are attached to the legislative files before you. Uh, the project will incorporate approximately 5,600 square feet of the existing uh, Gardner Bakery building. Uh, the project proposes 144 automobile parking stalls and 272 uh, indoor bike parking uh, stalls. Uh, the project is subject to a number of conditional use approvals, as noted by the chair including uh, dwelling units in a mixed-use building in the traditional employment zoning district, uh, approval to construct a building that exceeds five stories and 78 feet in TE zoning. And the project also requires an automobile parking reduction of greater than 20 parking spaces and 25% or more of the required parking uh, required for the project, uh, which also requires the plan commission to grant conditional use approval. In reviewing the project, uh, staff does believe that the many standards uh, before you can be met. Uh, the project is uh, or has been approved by the Urban Design Commission uh, to exceed the heights allowed in uh, Block 12 of Urban Design District 8, uh, which calls for uh, an eight story building along East Main Street and an up to 12 story building along East Washington Avenue. The project before you has a 14 story component closest to East Washington behind the portion of the Gardner building to be retained uh, and a nine story uh, section closest to East Main Street. The Urban Design Commission found that the project uh, is consistent with the requirements and guidelines in Urban Design District 8 and granted final approval of the building with the additional stories at its June 30th meeting. Uh, and uh, staff will otherwise refer you to the Urban Design Commission's report, which is attached to the legislative file for the demolition permit and conditional uses. Uh, of particular note for the project, and as just noted, uh, the majority of the two-story uh, Gardner Bakery building uh, located on the site uh, will be demolished to accommodate the new up to 14-story mixed-use building. Uh, the Landmarks Commission uh, reviewed this at their June 28th uh, meeting and advised the Plan Commission, uh, as noted in the report, uh, they uh, highlighted uh, the overall historic value of the building, uh, also noting that the, the building is noted as having some historic interest in the East Washington Avenue uh, Capital Gateway Plan. Uh, the portion of the building that's being retained dates back to 1917. However, the Urban Design Commission uh, noted or couldn't find that that portion of the building was more significant than any of the other portions of the building that are going to be demolished. Uh, and uh, so their 
uh, recommendation is noted uh, on, at the bottom of page six and the top of page seven of the staff report. Uh, staff regrets that more of the Gardner Bakery building is not being incorporated into the proposed development. However, we feel that the plan commission may find the demolition standards are met uh, following careful consideration of the findings of the Landmarks Commission. Uh, in recommending that the standards could be met, staff believes that incorporation of a, an important section of the building within the, the larger development will convey at least nominally the historic character uh, of this portion of the corridor consistent with the recognition that the building has in the East Washington Avenue Capitol Gateway Corridor Plan. Uh, in closing, uh, staff feels that the proposed building and the parking reduction can meet the standards for approval. Staff supports the amendment to the East Washington Avenue Capitol Gateway Corridor Plan uh, to change the recommended land use for the 800 block to include residential uses, uh, which we feel is appropriate uh, given the amount of commercial and office development that has occurred elsewhere on the block. And we feel that the proposed Baker's Place development uh, will contribute positively to the built environment that continues to emerge in the Capitol Gateway Corridor. I will be happy to answer any questions after the uh, public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I will open the public hearing. We do have several registrants wishing to speak. The first one is Nate Hellbach, Applewood Drive, Madison in support wishing to speak. Uh, you have three minutes. Thanks, Chair. I'm actually a part of the development team. Um, are we starting to present now as well? Um, yes. Um, you, so you are representing then the development team. Okay, yeah. yes, please go ahead. Okay, awesome. That sounds great. Well, thanks for having us here. We have Michael Green, Architects, and Angus Young also joining us. And then we have Jeff Held from Strand. And I'll be presenting, and then we have Ashton Stair from MGA, and we have Candace Nicole from MGA also presenting. And then we have Matt Brink, who is a development consultant here as well, to answer any questions. Um, Tim, you can flip to the next slide. Awesome. Um, so we'll get started here. So the neutral standard is an initiative to put our words into actions to build carbon neutral developments. Um, our goal is to try to eliminate carbon um, emissions from the environment and to minimize operational carbon emissions. Um, Tim, you can flip to the next slide. So our standard is rooted in designing the passive house energy standards, building with mass timber, and then also um, obtaining lead gold and verifying our approach with a third party life cycle analysis. Um, so we have a couple points here that we'll move through and then we'll get into our actual design. So Tim, you can move to the next slide. Awesome. Um, so water conservation is a low hanging fruit that we decided to pick as a part of our sustainability standard. We plan to have a low flow fixture, native landscaping, green roofs, and a reduction in stormwater and wastewater, um, which Ashton will discuss later on. Tim, you can move to the next slide. So we believe that the built environment should encourage healthy living and a communal lifestyle. This project aims to achieve this through um, first fitness. We plan to have a progressive and robust fitness center with access to personal trainers to allow our residents the ability to reactivate their physical and mental well-being. The second is thermal comfort. Uh, this concept aims to promote human productivity and provide a maximum level of thermal comfort among all residents through improved HVAC systems and other passive house design criteria. Uh, third, we have mine. So through our building tranquil and therapeutic green roofs and amenity spaces, residents will have an outlet to relax their minds. The fourth is nutrition. We believe that nutrition is a cornerstone of healthy lifestyles. Principles from the well building standard will play a key role in ensuring our residents have ease of access to healthy nutritional strategies. And lastly, and this is really key, is transportation. And the shift towards sustainable transportation options will be supported through ample EV charging, bike storage, and close proximity to rapid transit options. Further, a push for reduction in single opposite trips by residents will be encouraged through an electric vehicle car share, 
bike share and a reduction in on-site parking. Additionally, we plan to exceed the code required 2% of EV charges, charging stalls installed and 10%. Thank, thank you for your testimony. That concludes your three minutes. Um, the next registrant is Ashton Stair, 9th Avenue, Portland, Oregon, in support wishing to speak. And um, also, uh, my understanding from Nate Helbach is that Ashton is also representing the development team. You have three minutes. Liddell, is it possible to hand it over to Candace from our team and I'll go after her? Uh, that would be fine. So the next uh, registrant then is Candace Nickel, 9th Avenue, Portland, in support wishing to speak, also representing the development team. Three minutes. All right, thanks, Liddell. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, so if you could um, go to slide 11, Tim, that'd be awesome. So here you can see the site fronts East Washington, uh, Patter Street, and access from Main Street. You can also see the orientation of the site with great exposure to the south and views to the Wisconsin State Capitol, Lake Mendota, and Lake Monona as well. Then on the next slide, you can see the portion of the Gardner Bakery building. Um, Tim, could you go forward one more? Yeah, so the portion of the Gardner Bakery that fronts East Washington, and then you can see the 14-story massing that steps back from there, and then the 10-story massing that steps down towards nine. And then at street level, we have commercial and residential program on Main Street Patterson and a new muse space that we'll touch on later. This creates a really active street edge, inviting the public into the site. And in order to maximize activation at street level, we've used the commercial and the residential programs to wrap the parking on the ground floor. So the only um, part of the parking that you see is the entrance that faces the street on Main. As you move up the building, we have a three, uh, a level three garden um, for residents, along with apartments on the upper floors and rooftop amenity spaces. There are a total of 214 units and 65 of those units are two and three bedroom units and townhomes. On the next slide, Tim, we're looking at the elevation on East Patterson Street. You can see we've broken the building into three distinct volumes through articulation and height. At the street level on the middle and the left massing, we have townhomes with entries off of the street. And on the right, we have commercial space that turns the corner into the muse and activates and invites public into the site with the corner commercial space across from the existing building. On the next slide, we have views from East Washington showing the stepping of the massing and the relationship and gesture that that first three floors makes with the existing bakery. Pulling a horizontal connection across the site, but increasing density in a thoughtful way. On the next slide, we have a view um, on East Main Street looking down Patterson. You can see we've wrapped the townhomes around the corner and included an electric bike share room, making sure the Main Street facade is also active with program. On the next slide, we're looking between the existing and the new developments. We've designed a muse space, which is a narrow, intimate street that balances double-sided commercial spaces with a pedestrian focus and active entries to both buildings. It's also the main entry for the residents, ensuring it'll be a lively space. On the next slide, we'll see the south-facing courtyard and garden for residents of the project. This also serves as a biophilic connection and a meeting space to bump into your neighbors and a communal space for getting people together. I'm gonna hand off to Ashton. He's gonna finish up the presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ashton, you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, we have additional long views of the project showing how it's well situated with its neighbors like the archipelago development, galaxy apartments showing how the massing steps down and helps make the building feel compact and contextual. Uh, the next slide shows how we started off our facade and materiality studies. We wanted to review some of the important character buildings in Madison, um, looking at materiality, texture and proportion. On the next slide, in keeping with the sustainable goals of the project, we wanted to use more natural and weathering materials that have subtle variation in texture and fit within the context of the neighborhood. Um, so you can see here on the far left, cross-laminated timber, which is what the project is composed of, so a mass timber building. Um, on the next slide, for the upper portion of the building, we've selected a combination of flat and corrugated metal panels to add texture 
depth and variety. And for the lower portion, we're using a pre-weathered steel, which is a product that will evolve with age um, and it's pre-oxidized. So it doesn't result in staining. On the next slide, we have some elevations on Washington and Main Street. The project is under the airport height restriction and feels really well placed with its neighbors. And on the next slide, we have the South Patterson elevation. Um, we're well under the Capitol building height restriction and match the Galaxy Apartments across Washington, stepping down to Main Street in line with the character of both streets. The next slide shows our plan to achieve bonus stories. So we had submitted our packet with a lead gold equivalency approach, but we've decided to pursue lead gold certification in lieu of equivalency. Uh, we still plan to pursue passive house, but we're committing to lead gold to meet the bonus story requirement. And we're also only seeking one third of the allowable bonus stories, um, trying to remain contextual to the surroundings. On the next slide, we're showing how we plan to manage, uh, or sorry, engage the Madison Public Art Project through an RFP process, so working with a local artist. Our desire is for the art to celebrate the heritage of the neighborhood and use a uh, and site and create a dynamic experience on Main Street. The next slide outlines our stormwater approach using a system of green roofs to not only reduce the overall heat island effect, but also absorb and slow down the rate and reduce the volume of runoff in which we're exceeding the city requirements for 10-year storms. Uh, the development also achieves two and a half times the requirement for rainfall storage on site. The next slide outlines how landscape will play an integral role with elements like community garden that provides food for both people and insects and a four season landscape design, meaning color or texture throughout the year. And just quickly in closing, I want to reiterate a few things. The project meets all of the UDD-8 requirements and guidelines. It preserves a portion of the existing gardener bakery. It'll maintain existing businesses and create a neighborhood hub with the muse space. Um, it adds family size two and three bed units, putting a focus on family supportive housing. And finally, building uh, will be LEED Gold certified and constructed out of mass timber uh, with sustainable initiatives, ensuring a reduced carbon impact and an investment in community, green spaces and healthy homes. Thanks. Thank you. Our next registrant is Matt Brink, Tierney Drive, Wanakee in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing the neutral project. Jeff Held, West Wingra Drive, Madison in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing Strand Associates. Um, and that is it on the registrants um, available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, just a question of the applicant, and I'm not sure who I should talk to about the transportation demand management plan that they submitted in their materials. Uh, let's start with Nate Helbach, and he can. Yeah. Okay, Nate. Thank that you. would be uh, a Jeff Held and Strand put together the TDMP. Um, okay. And he's here tonight to answer any questions, Alder. Great. Great. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, certainly. Um, I can give a little overview of the TDMP, or did you have any specific? I just, I, I actually had just a couple of, of of relatively simple questions, and it it may be that Nate may get involved in answering these too. I'm not sure. Um, I appreciated uh, having that document to refer to, and it's great that you submitted that. Um, <clears throat> I. I, I I had a little trouble interpreting some of the tables in the in the TDM, but that might be my own ignorance. Um, but I, I saw, you know, mentions of things like uh, that. You let me see if I can get the right language. Uh, that you uh, may provide bus passes. It was kind of hedging, and so I wasn't sure if you were getting points in your calculation for 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 maybe providing. Uh, discounted or totally underwritten bus passes. What was the story on that? Yeah, I can I can start with that. Um, so the um, there's a couple of supplemental tables there that you referenced, and one of them is a draft spreadsheet from the city um, <clears throat> that scores. It, it provides a scoring system for the TDM measures. Um, 
and it's it's really sort of supplemental information. It's not really binding, um, but the the site does meet um, the um, required points from a TDM standpoint. Um, I think what's what's probably more um, uh, to the point is the the um, ordinance requirements for parking reduction. So the site is um, seeking um, a lower parking count then would be allowed under the ordinance with the 25% reduction. Um, so by ordinance, if the 25% reduction was allowed, there'd be 181 stalls, car stalls required. And the site is proposing 144. Um, the site is also proposing an eight vehicle Tesla electric car share. Um, and so that provides some buffer to that reduction beyond the 25% ordinance requirement. Um, in addition, it's it's providing an additional 61 bike stalls to also offset that that parking reduction. Um, so, in terms of the uh, ability to provide those bus passes, um, I can I can let Nate speak to that. Um, I think it's something that's uh, being explored, but I would say that um, the site, by its nature and as the TDM plan lays out, um, it's really conducive to reducing um, motor vehicle travel and um, it scores a, a excellent walk score, 91 out of 100, um, and a 100 out of 100 bike score, making it a walker and biker's paradise. <laughs> um, and uh, it's on the, mass, the, the BRT line, the uh, proposed BRT line. And so there are a lot of things that the site has going for it. It has on-site locker and shower facilities. Um, it has a separate entrance to the bike parking that's um, stair-free, and it has a bike maintenance facility indoors. Um, so I think from an overall TDM standpoint, it really, um, does about as well as you could do for a site in this location. Thanks. You, you answered one of my other questions, but, uh, so did the, were the bus passes included in the 42 points that you, uh, achieved? To be honest with you, I don't recall. Um, okay. I can look a little more, I have it in front of me, so I can look a little more closely. Um, and, uh, maybe we can come back to that. Okay, great. Thank you. That's my questions for now. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cantrell. My, my question relates to the, um, the Gardner uh, Bakery section of the project. It's my understanding that you're preserving the uh, section of the building uh, that would be from East Washington along Patterson back to the chimney. Um, and, and, and that is the original 1917 section of the building is, is that correct? Um, let's go to Nate Halbach, if we could keep him, uh, unmuted for the time being. Um, Nate Halbach, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. We, uh, believe that that was the original 1917 building and then there was two additions later on okay okay thank you that's that's all the questions i have at this time thanks are there any further questions of registrants i alder did hack. find um we, alder, we did hack. Not... Um, uh, alder hack Thanks. Uh, maybe I can ask Jeff real quickly to report what he learned. Okay. Unmute Jeff, please. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Yes. We, we did not claim the bus pass points. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then uh, one question I think for Nate, um, Nate, uh, I don't want to discourage you from all the fantastic transportation components in your package and TDM, but were you aware that uh, on the, Board of Parks Commissioners agenda for this week is an installation of two uh, uh, B cycle stations, Kitty Corner, from this site at Bree Stevens. I was not aware of that, all their heck, um, but that is that is interesting. Um, okay. That that definitely does play a role um, in our development, but I think it does not deteriorate the fact that we probably we will have um e-bikes as an um e-bike share and Good. for the main reason of we really want to encourage our residents to 
reduce single occupancy trips. And if you have e-bikes on site, that, that really encourages that. And so, um, of course, right across the street would be awesome as well, but both would be even better. So that's a big upside for us. So that's good. Thanks, to hear. Given, given your location and proximity to the Cap City Trail and the dangers of crossing East Washington, I'd encourage you to go through with that. Thanks. Are there further questions? Um, I have a question. I think it would be probably Nate Helbach. Um, so you are committing to eight electric car share vehicles. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that is that is correct, Chair. We uh, plan to have a resident app that the residents will be able to um, lease out for an hour or half hour or however long they want a Tesla. Um, we might have a couple lower end um, EV um, vehicles as well. That would be um, less per hour. And it's going to be eight total. And those will be able to be leased out on a per half hour basis. And tenants will be able to go grab groceries, go do errands, bring them back. Um, plug them back in and it's a pretty seamless process. And are you managing that yourselves in terms of this um, this building in those spots or are you contracting that out? No, we, we plan to have that as a part of our resident portal and our resident app. Okay. And and along that's the same thing for e-bikes as well. Okay. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um I think that's the, oh, the, one other question I did have in front of um, the Gardner Bakery and on the other side of the building, um, is the sidewalk staying the same width in the, in the front on the East Washington side? And what is the sidewalk width on the um, other side of the building then, Patterson side? Yeah, I uh, I can answer the first one. The second one I'll direct to uh, Ashton or Candice. Um, the front portion of the Baker's Place building, that original building, we're not really changing anything. We're redoing the interiors um, for some of the existing tenants there, um, but the sidewalk will not be amended. Um, on the side there on Patterson, I am not sure what the width is. I believe it's staying the same, but Candice or Ashton, could you please confirm that? Could you please unmute Ashton? Yes, I believe that that is staying the same. I don't have the dimension for that. In, oh, six feet here, I believe. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Any other questions of our registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I will close the public hearing. Are there any questions of staff? Are there any questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, I will recommend that the Planning Commission approve uh, the proposed amendment to the East Washington Avenue uh, capital Gateway Corridor Plan, and the one lot uh, certified survey map, uh, uh, and forwarded that to the Common Council with a favorable recommendation, and find that the standards are met and approve the demolition permit and conditional uses to construct a 14-story mixed-use uh, building at 849 East Washington Avenue and 14 South Patterson Street. Um, and that's all I have for now. Okay, is there a second? Seconded by Alder Heck. Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? Yes, 
Uh, I think this project does it all. Uh, actually, it, it um, incorporates uh, a, um, an important historic building along the East Washington Corridor, uh, uh, which I think it, they incorporate the, an important portion of the building um, and, and uh, create apartments and some commercial uses exactly where we want them. Uh, within the exciting East of Washington corridor that's uh, emerging. Uh, the building provides a lot of amenities and, um, uh, and, and uh, we certainly need residential development in the city, especially in the downtown area where the transportation and uh, urban infrastructure is provided. And, and again, this project does it all. And I, I'm very excited about it. And I, I'm, I'm glad they're bringing it forward. I'd like to see other projects similar to this uh, brought forward along the East uh, Washington corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion, comments? Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, agenda item 13, Legistar 65486, located at 3802 Regent Street, Fifth Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional residential consistent to district for a school and consideration of a conditional use pursuant to section 28.139 of the zoning code for non-residential development adjacent to a public park to allow renovation of and construction of in addition to the former white school to enable its conversion into Capitol High School. And uh, Heather is going to give us a bit of information about this. Um, Heather. Thank you, Chair Zellers. I, I wanna thank Chris Wells for reviewing this project. I'm going to just provide a very brief overview before the testimony that we have. Um, as Lowell mentioned, there are two conditional uses being sought. The changes proposed are, are minimal. Um, MMSD is, is proposing a very small addition, about a thousand square foot addition on the north side of the existing old Hoyt School building. Um, this will consist of an elevator, a small vestibule, and restroom facilities. Windows will be replaced, and minor site changes to improve pedestrian circulation on the site are also proposed. Um, importantly, this was reviewed by the city's landmarks commission and found to uh, meet all of the standards. Uh, they approved it due to its adjacency to the, the Hoyt Park next door, which is actually a, a local landmark. And it also received final approval from the Urban Design Commission, uh, since it is a, a public building. It went to the Urban Design Commission as well. Um, one of the more notable conditions of approval that I want to mention to the Plan Commission is uh, for Metro Transit. There's a condition that MMSD uh, add a 100-foot-long concrete uh, boarding pad basically to, to serve this site and, and staff believes that, um, that the applicant is agreeable to that and um, certainly hope that that will enhance the transit experience for the many students and, and staff uh, going to this building. And I think I'll stop it there and we can move on to testimony. Happy to try to take any questions following that. Okay, thank you. Um, I will open the public hearing. The first registrant is Angela Madeline, uh, Regent Street, opposed and wishing to speak. You have three minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, for context, I live directly across from Hoyt Park. And my concerns are a couple of things. Uh, one being the traffic issues. As the last person just alluded to, it pertains to the many students and staff who will now be at this location. And the traffic issues are already a significant problem down Regent Street and into the uh, Owen Parkway overlook. And as a small neighborhood street, intentionally no sidewalks, um, I foresee the volume of cars 
getting much, much worse and making a problem that is already a problem getting consistently worse. And so it doesn't seem to me that this street is intended for the volume of what is to come. The neighborhood meetings, which I've attended, stated that students, there would be, quote, students who primarily don't drive that attend there. And I guess I'm interested in the data that supports that. I heard that a couple of times. I noticed that in the paperwork, um, the proposal is for 23 parking stalls, parking spaces. So when those are taken up by the many students and staff, where will they park? Will they park in Hoyt Park? What is going to happen there? That's a concern. What are the routes for buses? Um, the meetings that I've, at least that I've attended, um, haven't really indicated what those paths are to be, the traffic flow out of the school. And you talked about a TDM, I think, in items six through eight on your agenda. I don't know if that's been done here. If it has, I haven't heard that spoken to. Um, my other point is, you know, this conditional use permit. I'm interested to know what future expansions and permissions does this allow granting this now down the road? Yes, it's a thousand square foot addition at the back. Um, what does this open the door for in the future? So those are my, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, registrant to speak is Barry Berman, 3933 Regent Street, Madison, opposed, wishing to speak. You have three minutes. Okay, I, uh, my name is Barry Berman. I would like to agree with uh, my neighbor, Angela, who's a few houses down. Uh, I'm here to voice my opposition to converting Hoy School to <clears throat> to a high school. It's going to, it is going to bring a large increase in vehicular and pedestrian traffic uh, to the Hoyt Park neighborhood and also to Hoyt Park itself. Um, there are two. There were two informational meetings that I went to on this project uh, in 2019 and 2020 before COVID, uh, but uh, after that, I did not hear anything about the project. Uh, the meetings were well attended, but uh, I don't know how many attendees actually lived near Hoyt School or whether they were just attending as interested parties. Uh, there were questions uh, about potential impact for the school and the neighborhood and Hoyt Park. Uh, there was no call for people to express support or oppose the school moving uh, to this location. Uh, I did express my opposition at both meetings. Regent Street is, is a very narrow street uh, until it reaches Hoyt School, which is why the residents uh, were able to petition the city to install those dreadful speed humps um, that they hoped would slow down traffic and discourage traffic. Uh, it's only, the street itself is only wider directly in front of Hoyt, Hoyt School. Uh, I don't believe that the people living in this neighborhood want to encourage more traffic uh, from a high school use, um, and the residents on Regent Street uh, have used the neighborhood traffic management program to put the speed humps in to slow down traffic and discourage it from Franklin to uh, Hoyt School. Traffic calming planters have been installed from Mineral Point Road to Regent Street uh, on Glenway Street. And then residents on Larkin Street requested speed humps from Mineral Point Road to Hoyt School. Uh, the only way to access Hoyt School without uh, navigating traffic calming devices is to drive through Owen Parkway, which is through Hoyt Park. And it's, it's currently a very rustic road. Uh, I can't imagine that much traffic going in that road. From memory, Hoyt School is uh, supposed to uh, in, have 35 to 50 cars for students. Uh, maybe there's more for staff. I really don't remember. Uh, I assume buses would bring the balance of uh, the 180 students that were projected initially, but the total enrollment could grow to 300 students and possibly 100 cars. And that doesn't include parents dropping their kids off. Um, I think that that would have quite an impact uh, for traffic in the neighborhood. So my wish is for Capital School to find a location where traffic will not have so much of an impact, uh, uh, vehicular or pedestrian. And um, 
I'm just wondering if the people that live nearby have a say in what happens in the Hoyt School area. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you for your testimony. There is one more registrant uh, who is available to answer questions. Kirk Lewis, Chicago Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Questions of any of our registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I'll close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Cantrell. Um, has the staff talked to the school district about the um, proposed number of students that they're planning to have at this uh, um, school and, and the number of staff uh, that would be uh, accommodating the school and, and exactly how many parking spaces they're proposing? They are proposing 23 parking spaces. Um, which are on the site, so there, it's not a it's not a new proposal. Um, we do in conversations with the school district. We understand that that transit will be a major component of the expected transportation to and from the school for the students. I don't have a number. Um, I know that Chris Wells would have a number, but I'm not seeing it in the staff report either of the initial student body and you know what's expected for the long term um let's see no i don't i don't have that number but i do think it's it's in the 200 range one of the conditions that i wanted to mention for the plan commission to take a look at is from uh traffic engineering staff it's condition number 16 and that's that the applicant mmsd shall submit uh, for their review, a student drop-off and pickup plan, including the number of students, the estimated transportation modes, and arrival times, and, and any loading zones. And so that requirement would be reviewed by traffic engineering staff prior to this um, small addition moving forward. Um, do you have further questions, Commissioner Cantrell? So, what the, plan, the planning, uh, what the plan commission is reviewing tonight is a conditional use because it's located next to a public park. The, the proposed addition is only a thousand square feet for an elevator shaft and very minor addition. Ms. Stouter is frozen. Um, that's my understanding, um, Commissioner. Okay. Cor correct. So there are two, sorry, there are two conditional uses. One, am I frozen still? No, you're back on again. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention also that the, the second conditional use is for a school in the traditional residential consistent two district. So there's a land use and then there's just the fact that it happens to be adjacent to a park. But we're not considering that it was originally a school and, um, the original land use was a school. Obviously, it was Hoyt School. I think that that's a great point. Okay. Um, I would also note, and whether these figures are accurate, but online, uh, Capital High School currently serves about 172 students. So just okay. to add that to the mix. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you have further questions, Commissioner Cantrell? Not at this point, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Solheim. Just a, a quick question on, on parking. In the zoning summary table, I can see that the number of parking stalls required is tied to um, the number of classrooms and legal driving age students. So in my experience, that's something that um, an applicant needs to submit to zoning prior to getting 
state plan approval on the building permit, I assume that would be the same case here. They'd have to tie their number of parking stalls to those statistics. Yes, that's correct. In order to get final sign off. And in that process, if they're seeking a reduction that's within you know, 20 stalls of the, the required number of stalls, the zoning administrator could administratively approve that reduction. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Are there other questions? Seeing no raised hands, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. Well, I'm going to recommend that the plan commission find the standards are met and approve the conditional use for a school in the traditional residential consistent two district and for a non-residential non development adjacent to a public park uh, to allow the renovation and construction of an addition to the former Hoyt School to enable the conversion to the Capitol High School at 3802 Regent Street. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Solheim. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, I, you know, I'm saddened that the school district is not here to, to speak. Um, uh, I think it would have been important for them to be here tonight to, to give some uh, testimony. Uh, I, I think that... Uh, it, really, this is a minor change. This was this uh, building was built as a school, so it's no surprise that it would likely be a school in the future. The additions that are proposed are very minor, um, um, and I, and our testimony, at least, and the, the information we have, that uh, most of the students will arrive by bus, and that's why they're creating a bus uh, platform uh, for that entity. Uh, and 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 my hope is that the traffic engineer will be working with the school district to uh, adequately address some of the the traffic issues. Uh, so I guess that's why I'm supporting this and um, recommend that it be approved. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, are there any further comments? Input. Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Um, moving on, the next item, business by members. Do we have any business by members? Seeing no raised hands, we'll go on to the secretary's report. Heather Stouter. Thank you, Chair Zellers. Um, uh, quickly, the, the Common Council at their last meeting did approve uh, both the Hanson Road Neighborhood Development Plan and the, the rezoning that was related to that at 4205 Portage Road upon the recommendation of the Plan Commission, and also the rezoning at 6201 Mineral Point Road and Genomic Drive. Looking forward to July 26th, we anticipate a, a relatively robust meeting on that date. Um, first on the list here is the proposal at 1858 to 1890 East Washington Avenue. This is the corner of East Washington Avenue and First Street for a new mixed use building with 290 apartment units. And next uh, at 222 to 232 East Olin Avenue, a rezoning and uh, approval of <clears throat> an 18 story mixed use building with 290 apartment units as well. And then third on the list, uh, the return of the Ramish Farm plat and rezoning at uh, 4,000 to 4150 Packers Avenue and also North Sherman Avenue. And so that's one that the plan commission has seen uh, a couple months ago and, and will return to you uh, in a couple weeks. Um, those are the ones that I'll mention. Uh, I did want to mention one on the list here, the zoning text amendment pertaining to the Williamson Street maximum building heights. That was another issue discussed at the late December 2020 meeting. Um, this will actually be pushed out another meeting or two in order to make space for a neighborhood meeting uh, in late July to be held on this subject. And so it, it won't actually come to you on the 26th as noted here. That's my mistake in, in including that there. Um, 
looking forward to, to August 9th. Um, I, I think that the, the discussion will probably be a bit quicker on this, this evening. I, I just want to mention the first item on the list, uh, you know, fairly close to the item we were just discussing, MMSD uh, will be back again with their proposed changes to West High School. And so we've seen um, we've seen their proposed changes to uh, La Follette and the Hoyt School this evening. Um, on August 9th, we'll see um, both West and the second item on the list, actually their proposed changes to East High School as well. And I wanted to mention, uh, again, I, I am sorry to not have for you this evening, as promised, a uh, summary of the hotel updates. Um, Chris Wells did great work pulling that together. We need to, to package that up and get it to you, and I'll, I'll have it for you at your next meeting. Apologies. I simply went on vacation and did not get that done before I left, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and then one last thing I'll mention for a near future meeting, likely a September meeting, staff would like to bring to the plan commission uh, an update on the process for the East Town Mall planning process. And you'll find some similar themes as you've seen recently for the, the Odana area plan. Um, our thinking is, since we've learned so much from the plan commission guidance on the Odana area plan, we may just need to come to plan commission one time before this is ready for formal introduction. Um, and so we're we're working with the, the staff team and chair sellers now to, to pin down that date, but anticipate that it would likely come to you in September uh, for a final look before uh, a late 2021 introduction. I think that's all I have. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, any other announcements? Seeing none, I would be looking for a motion to a uh, adjourn. Moved by Commissioner Cantrell. Is there a second? Seconded by Alder Lemmer. We, uh, I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, we are adjourned. Thank you all.